welcome. My name is Seth McLaughlin. I'm a web developer, uh, web developer here at LinkedIn. Um, and today we're going to be talking about unit testing with JavaScript. So is everybody in the right place? <laughs> um, so uh, to get started, um, the web development team here at LinkedIn has a what we call a horizontal group focused on unit testing. And these people that you see behind me up on the screen are the members of this team. And we've been spending a lot of time over the past few months thinking about how can we bring comprehensive test coverage to um, our client-side code, because we traditionally have not had unit tests in place for client-side JavaScript here at LinkedIn. And that's um, unfortunate, because unit testing, as you'll see today, can be quite helpful. If you're not already convinced of that, hopefully you will be by the end of this talk. So you know, be honest. Raise your hand if this kind of sums up your feelings about JavaScript and testing. All right, a couple people are willing to admit that. Um, the thing that, uh, one of the things that we're trying to get across today is that JavaScript is a real language too. Um, uh, you know, a lot of complicated code is being written here at LinkedIn in JavaScript now. Um, as we talked about in the previous boot camps, JavaScript is a pretty uh, complex language. You can build a lot with it. So as, as such, when you have a lot of code, you want to make sure you can test it so that you can maintain it and uh, improve upon it over time. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to start with a very brief discussion of what unit testing is. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, as being engineers, I'm assuming that all of you have a, at least a basic familiarity with what unit testing is and what it's used for. But we're going to focus a little bit on test-driven development as well, uh, talking about how that relates to unit testing and why that's a good thing and why you should care about it. And then we'll move into some JavaScript-specific topics, talking about JavaScript the language, running JavaScript in the browser, how that makes testing JavaScript a bit different than, say, uh, writing a unit test for Java or some other language that you may be more familiar with. Um, next, we'll cover how you actually run a unit test in the browser, just the basic mechanics of it. We'll just give a high-level overview of that. Um, and then we'll move on to a discussion of a couple of the libraries, frameworks, and tools that you can use to run and write and run your JavaScript unit tests. And finally, we'll wrap up with uh, an, in, uh, an exercise where we look through some code and talk about how that could be written with tests a test-first approach. So what is a unit test? Does anybody, anybody know? Anybody want to offer a definition? No? OK. Uh, well, the way I like to think of it is a unit test is a test for the smallest testable chunk of your application. So usually what this comes down to is you're writing a test to exercise a particular function some given input, and you're expecting some output. And the idea is if you test these small chunks of your application or, or program, then you're likely to catch at least the most obvious bugs early on. Um, of course, you could still have bugs with integration uh, and, uh, and later on in your code, but it can help catch a lot of issues early on. So unit tests are isolated and independent. This means that if you're testing code in module A, um, you want to only be testing, only running, executing code in that module and not testing code in some other module. Um, they're also repeatable. So if you run a given set of tests one time, you get one result with no code changes. You should be able to run those tests again and get the same result. They're used in, they can be used, and they should be used, in a couple of different places uh, at, a, at, at a shop like ours. Um, they can be used during development. So as you're writing your code, if you take a test-first approach, you're writing your test along with your code so that you can very quickly catch bugs that you introduce into the code that you're writing. They're also used during um, continuous integration. So if you check in code to our trunk, you should be able to run unit tests on your JavaScript code, just like on your other code to quickly see if uh, there are any issues. Not going to catch all the issues, of course, but it helps quite a bit. So a couple of things to keep in mind with unit testing in general, and this applies to JavaScript unit testing. It's not a silver bullet 
right? It's not going to solve all of your problems. You could write really great unit tests. You could you know, apply them in just the right way, and you still could find bugs in your application. But it will help quite a bit and catch a lot of bugs early on. And the other thing I like to personally keep in mind is don't get too hung up on semantics. If you look on Stack Overflow or any, any popular question and answer technical site, there's all kinds of arguments about what is a unit test, what is an integration test, what are the precise differences, where does the precise cutoff uh, come, and when does a unit test stop being a unit test. I don't personally think that's super important. As long as we're testing our code um, and we're, we have the right attitude about it, then we're going to write better code and we're going to have a uh, better quality product for our users. OK, so test-driven development. Does anybody here practice test-driven development actively? No? OK, one, maybe two. Um, <clears throat> To be perfectly honest, I'm somewhat of a recent convert to test-driven development. You know, uh, back when I was in engineering school, obviously I took some classes on test-driven development and people said, oh yeah, this is a great idea, you should totally go do this. And you know, I never really saw much value. I was like, ah, yeah, it seems like extra work. It's not really, why, why bother, I'll just go code. Um, but once you start doing it, you kind of, you kind of get addicted to it. And the idea is that as you're writing your code, as you're implementing a class, as you're implementing a function, you're also writing test code to execute those functions in those classes. Your tests are, very, are usually very simple, uh, very simple assertions. You say you call a function or you execute some code and you expect a certain value, and that's true or false. So you'll know very easily if your test, in fact, passed or failed. One of the benefits of uh, test-driven development is that it really forces you to stop and think as you're coding. Because you have to actively execute and exercise your code from your test code, it helps you see early design problems and how you're arranging your code or organizing logic. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of leads into the next point, which is using these tests, writing these tests will drive uh, good design, and it will force decoupling of and uh, prevent too many dependencies within your code. And we'll look at some examples of that later on. Basic flow of test-driven development is you write your test, you write some implementation code, you run your test, see if everything's good. If it's not, you'll go you know, fix the problem, uh, and then rinse and repeat. You just keep going through that cycle. So benefits. Why, why do I feel so strongly that this is a good thing? Why should you care? Why should you, you know, stop not writing tests and start writing tests? Um, like I've mentioned a couple times, and I just really want to hammer home, is that you can find problems very early. Uh, you know, everybody, well, every one of us should know that the earlier you find a bug, the cheaper it is to fix. If you find a bug once it's gone to alpha or production, it's, it's no good, and it's a, lot, it's a lot harder to fix. That takes more time. Um, one other benefit of test-driven development, which is really amazing once you actually get a decent level of test coverage for your code, is that you can refactor uh, without too much concern. If you had a very critical module in one of your applications, and you didn't have tests, and you went in and you tweaked some of the implementation or changed some of the behavior, maybe you're trying to make you know, uh, a performance optimization, or you know, any, any one of a number of things, you may have inadvertently broken some edge case that you just didn't think about or didn't try to manually run through when you were done coding. But if you had a good suite of uh, unit tests, you could just run those tests, and you could see if you had any failures. Now, obviously, it's possible that you just didn't write a test case um, to cover a particular scenario, and that does happen. However, once you do find a bug, you can update your unit test to cover that scenario and, and, and thus protect yourself in the future against um, uh, regressing in that area. Um, as, you, as you write your code, you're going to be testing, right, regardless of whether you call it unit testing or not. If you're working on some JavaScript um, control and you write some code, you're going to fire up your browser, you're going to load up a page, pulls in your JavaScript, 
and you're going to click around or do whatever it is you need to do until you get to the point where you actually execute that code. And then you'll see, oh man, hmm, did that logic I just added work as I expected? Um, or you may pull up your uh, developer console and type in some JavaScript commands, try to run that function. So you're going to be doing this anyways, right? And if you formalize it into unit tests that you can run from the command line, it's going to save you a lot of time. You can run the tests in multiple browsers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can run the test from your IDE, potentially. And you don't have to switch out to the browser and manually try to click around until you just happen to hit the code path that you're trying to test. Unit tests can also provide great documentation, because a test case has a list of tests that very clearly document um, each, uh, each part of the functionality of your module or, or um, class. And it says what the expected output is for a given input. It helps communicate both to yourself, a future version of yourself, and other developers what that particular code is supposed to do. Um, and unlike written documentation, it's guaranteed to be correct, or else your tests are going to be failing. And finally, um, like we've been saying, it, it helps you design better code. You have to think a lot more as you're implementing your code, and that's, that's nothing but a good thing. So JavaScript is a, it's a very interesting language. Um, and especially if you're coming from a Java background, there are you know, some differences, which we've been talking about throughout this series. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here that have an impact on how you would test your JavaScript code. So the first thing we'll talk about is proxy objects. So in traditional um, OOP, Java, like a Java type language, if you want to test a function and you want to check if a given function is called, there are a couple of different ways you could do that. JavaScript has a unique, uh, unique capability in, of, how to, of how to do this. It makes it very easy. So let's walk through this code sample. The, this is a function called person that I'm going to be using as a constructor function to create a new person object. I'm passing a name. I assign that to a property on the object. And then I assign a property called greet, which is just a function that prints out a greeting and the person's name. So here, if I instantiate a new person with the parameter of Bob, and I call bob.greet hello, I'll get the text hello Bob printed out. But say, for example, I want to intercept a call to the greet method and do something in there, right? I want to be able to check in my test. I want to be able to count maybe how many times that function was called, or something of that nature. This code will help me do that. So what I can do is using object.getOwn properties, property names, I can iterate through all of the properties on this object. I can check to see if it's a function. And then I can replace it with a new function that will execute some arbitrary code and then call the original function. So this is a pretty powerful uh, feature which, of JavaScript, which uh, in some cases can help you write test cases much more easily. So I can show you an example of this. Let's see here. So if I just say, bump up the font size a little bit. Code sample one. So you can see that the first time it was called, it just said hello Bob. The second time it said goodbye Bob, but it injected that console.log of this string intercept it called the function greet. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's go back. So next thing I want to talk about is the multiple runtimes, multiple multiple environments that your JavaScript can run in, right? There's different browsers, there's different operating systems. Um, there's definitely a lot of different JavaScript engines, which while they follow a standard, they all can interpret um, the language a little bit differently. They can provide host objects, which act slightly differently. And we traditionally, uh, as web developers and, and um, engineers, we've heard a lot about Internet Explorer and how older versions of IE have compatibility problems. But there can also be compatibility problems uh, with two modern browsers. So take, for example, Firefox and Chrome. So take a look at this code example. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the string, hello, earthlings. 
I'm encoding it using the JavaScript encode URI component function, and I'm assigning it to the hash of the window.location object. And when, basically, when I call encode URI component, it's going to encode this space here to percent 20. So when I call console.log and say window.location.hash equals the value of the hash, I would expect it to print out hello percent 20 earthlings. So let's see what happens. So if I, here I am in Chrome. I'm going to say code sample 2. And that's exactly what I got. Hello, percent 20 earthlings. OK, cool. And now let's go over to Firefox. I'm going to say the same thing. So I'm writing the same code here. Can anybody see the difference? What's, what's, what's different about this output? That's right. There's no percent 20. So in Firefox, when you access the window.location.hash property, it will, without your asking, decode the string. And this is actually a, a real problem. It's actually a real bug that I ran into um, during my normal job. So having a unit test uh, can save you a lot of hassle, because you'll catch things like this much earlier on. So another thing to keep in mind when you're working with um, JavaScript and testing JavaScript within the context of a browser is that you'll often have controls written in JavaScript that interact with your, with your DOM within a web page in some way. And you'll likely be often, oftentimes you'll be using DOM events. So you'll be listening for things like the user mousing over an, uh, an element and doing something, or you'll be listening for a click on a particular object and then you'll do something. So in this case, on this page, I have a simple um, event listener hooked up so that when I click reply, it prints out this string. So, and if I click on this one, it'll print out replying to message and then the ID of that particular message, which was 100. Okay, so if I was going to unit test this code, what I could do is say I'm, if I'm using jQuery, for example, or you can do this using native, native DOM functions as well, like I say, select all the reply elements, and I want to trigger the click event. And so programmatically, I simulate it clicking on that button. Um, and that, you know, that, that technique can be really useful. So you want to keep in mind that uh, event simulation is available and, and it can oftentimes uh, should be used. The last thing I'll just touch on right here is as um, as most of you know, uh, JavaScript is a dynamic, dynamically typed language. You do not have type safety, um, which is a, you could say it's a blessing and a curse. But the fact of the matter is that you, since it's not compiled, you don't catch type issues at compile time like you would in other languages. So if we look at this code here, we just have a simple function that is called greet, takes in a string, or excuse me, an object called person. And we just say console.log, hello. And then we look at the person.name property, and we try to capitalize it. So we're assuming it's a string, basically, right? The next couple of lines, we create two objects. The first one is Seth. It's an object, and we give it a property of Seth. Um, the next one, we give it the uh, same, same property name, but we, this time we specify a Boolean value, specify false. So when we call greet with a Seth object, it prints hello, capital Seth, which is what we expect. However, and, and say that's how you're executing your code the first time you run it. You think, oh, it's fine. It works, no problem. However, here, um, the next time we execute it, if we say greet anonymous, we get an uncaught type error because the Boolean value does not have a method called to uppercase. So there is this whole class of issues that you won't catch uh, simply by compiling your code because there is no compilation step. All right, so next we're going to talk about the basic anatomy of running a, a, a test in the browser. It's a very, very simple idea. Um, essentially, to properly test your code, you'll want to run it in the environment in which it will ultimately run in, which means running your code in the browser. Um, <clears throat> and to do that, you need to load a web page. So most frameworks offer some, some method of creating a 
uh, a test fixture page um, that will do a couple of things. So it will load up any dependencies that you might want to have available to your tests. Say here we, we're loading up jQuery. Uh, it will pull in the testing library that you're using, which could be something like Mocha or one of the other ones, which we'll talk about next. You'll pull in the code that you're actually trying to test, in this case, message.js, and then you'll pull in your test code. So where is your test case uh, defined? And then you'll tell the test library to start running the tests. And usually, you'll have some sort of um, placeholder element in your DOM, which will uh, be used to populate with the test results once the tests have finished running. So what are some of the libraries and frameworks out there? Um, there's quite a few. They're not all created equally. Some, do, some try to do different things. Um, some are more of a complete solution uh, than others. Just going from the top, JS Test Driver is a pretty cool project put out by Google that's actually written in Java, um, but it's designed to help you write and, and, and run your tests. Um, we do use that to some degree here at LinkedIn. Uh, Mocha is a pretty nice lightweight framework um, that we're using on the mobile server side a little bit, that's my understanding. Uh, Jasmine is another similar framework. Um, QUnit is the testing framework created uh, by jQuery. Uh, it was originally part of jQuery, but then it was separated out so you can use it as a standalone framework. Um, our Lou uh, project here at LinkedIn uses QUnit currently to, to write and run tests. And then signon.js is really more of a, um, it's kind of a helper library. So it's not a framework in and of itself, per se, but it provides things like spies and mock, it helps you create mock objects and typical test helpers that you would need to write good tests. And finally, Venus is a tool that we are developing here at LinkedIn to help us run our, our tests. And the design of Venus is not to be a test API in and of itself, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but rather it's a convenient tool to help us run tests for any of the other frameworks that people throughout the company are using. And we'll be, we won't go into much detail on Venus today, but we will have a future tech talk where we discuss the design and goals of, of the Venus project. All right, so next thing I want to do is walk you through an example of actually writing tests and taking a test-driven approach to your, your coding lifestyle. Um, so the first thing I'll do is actually show you a bad example of code that is not testable and not particularly well written. Okay, so this is our, this is our test demo page. Um, you can imagine that each of these gray boxes represent a message, an email message or something that we want to have on the page. And what we have noticed here is that we see the subject line, we see who it's from, and we see the contents of the message, and then we see this really long string. And it turns out that this really long string is just simply a Unix timestamp. And what we'd like to do as the first part of our messages control, JavaScript control, is we want to reformat uh, this timestamp to be a friendly date. And in particular, we want to tell the user how long ago this message was received. So if we look at the first example here, you can see that when the JavaScript runs, it reformats that timestamp to say, you know, it's one day ago, 13 days ago, 1,000 days ago, right? Um, so let's take a look at the code for this example. So first we have our HTML, just a bunch of, um, well, a list with a bunch of list items. And down here, we have one function called pretty print dates, which is kind of a mess. Um, we're selecting the elements, we're looping through them. We have some kind of, kind of hard to parse logic here that decides what to print out for the string. Um, and that's pretty much it, and then we just call that function. So unfortunately, a lot of JavaScript uh, is kind of written this way, and that's a shame, because this is not very testable. And it's hard to, hard to read. Um, and with our, with our current test page, we don't really know if it works properly, because we, we aren't seeing any of the cases where, say, the message was received three seconds ago or two hours ago. 
We don't know if that logic is working properly. So with that in mind, let's pop over to our console and we'll redevelop uh, this control with a test-driven approach. So the first thing that we'd like to do is let's take that JavaScript code out of the markup. Um, let's put it in its own, own file and its own module. So first, I have an empty directory here. And I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to create a new f uh, file for our code called messages.js. And I'm going to create a test directory. I'm going to create a new test in this test directory. So we could have put this test anywhere. It doesn't really matter. A common convention is to use a test or a specs directory to put your tests. So let's pop this guy open. So now we have our test. So we could use any test framework we want, but today I'm going to use Mocha syntax for writing this test. Um, so the first thing I do is I have a describe statement which basically says, you know, what are we testing? So in this case, I'm going to say I'm going to test the messages module. And I'll give it a function body here where I can define my test. And the first thing I want to do is just think through what is the logic that I'm going to have to implement for this whole thing to work. Well, I have to be able to select um, elements from the DOM that should contain timestamp. So I have to know which, which, which timestamp elements there are there. Um, then I have to be able to convert uh, a millisecond value to a uh, friendly value in seconds. I have to be able to do the same thing for um, minutes and the same thing for hours and days. And there's probably some other tests I could write, but for the, for the sake of this discussion, we'll, we'll keep it at those, at those uh, several tests. Um, OK, so let's go through and try to start writing some of our tests. So the syntax I'll use is I'll say it and then should select all DOM elements that match timestamp class. So the idea here is that if you combine your describe title and your it text, it will kind of read like an like a English sentence. It will say, the messages should select all DOM elements that match timestamp class. Um, so rather than creating a, uh, just a function name that begins with test, for example, and it has some, some, some uh, not so descriptive name, we can actually write a full sentence to make uh, it clear what is actually being tested. So let's start with uh, implementing this test. So I'm going to say, you know, messages dot select elements. I think that's what I'll call this, uh, this particular function. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to pass in a selector string to, to pick out what elements I want. So I'll say dot, uh, let's, let's go with, you know, TS for timestamp, just for fun. Um, and then I'll have to pass in, well, I want to pass in a container. So I'm going to look for, in particular, DOM node as the container that's going to hold all these timestamp elements. That could be the body, that could be you know, a particular div that I, that I choose. Um, and they'll look in there and give me back a list of all of the timestamp elements. So I'm just going to call this container. And then I'm actually going to assign the result of this to a variable. And I'll call it elements. And then I can say expect elements dot length to be four, because I'm going to expect to have four of these, say, for example. So I know this isn't going to work, but let's just run it. Let's see what happens. So I come over here. I'm going to use Venus to run it. So I'm basically just saying, look in the test directory, pull all those tests. We only have one right now. Run them. 
And I'm going to say use PhantomJS. PhantomJS is a headless WebKit browser. So essentially, it lets you run a real browser, but from the command line. So you don't have to worry about popping into a UI. So I'll just hit Enter here. And we can see that we have an error. Um, actually, let me, let me swap the colors here. Can you guys see that, or is the other version better? Like you like the white better? OK. Well, this blue should be red, but it's an error. So the first error is uh, you know, reference error. Can't find variable messages. OK, that makes sense. We haven't even defined our messages module yet. All right. So some of this is for the sake of example. You may, you know, when you're writing your test, you're like, yeah, OK, of course, I have to define my, my messages module first. So let's just go ahead and take care of that. So let's go ahead and open up um, the messages. And there's a lot of different ways we could implement this. For now, I'm just going to define a global object called messages. And I'm going to stick on uh, some functions or methods to this object. So the first one I need is select elements. And that's going to take in a, it's going to be a function. And it's going to take in a, um, a selector string and a, and a container element. And I'm going to return uh, query selector all will select the elements matching the selector string. And that's it. So now, We'll try to run our test again. Still can't find a variable messages. What's going on? Oh, of course. I didn't actually tell my test case to pull in that file. So what I can do up here is use an annotation to say include um, messages.js. And I just say dot dot slash messages.js because that's one directory level up from where we are now, where this file lives. Go back, try to run it one more time. OK, making some progress. We have a new error. So now it says reference error, can't find variable container. OK, that makes sense. I haven't actually defined it yet. So let's go back and fix that here on our test. So I'm going to create a new variable called container. And what we want this to be is essentially a div or some other element that will contain uh, a series of timestamp uh, elements that will hold timestamps. So let's just create, there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, for, for now, I'm just going to create this using uh, the DOM, DOM functions in, mark, in here to create these elements. So let's clean this up a little bit. So I'm going to say, create some markup here. And I'm going to say this is, uh, let's see, these are the timestamp elements we want. So I'm going to say class equals TS, because that's what we're using for these guys. I'm going to say I'll create four of these. OK. And then I'm going to say container is going to be uh, a div. So I'm going to say document.create element div. And then I'm just going to set the uh, inner HTML of this element to my markup. Great. So now I have my container uh, element. OK. So. Now we have our container. It includes some divs which have the correct class of timestamp. And now let's see if this thing works. Undefined is not an object. Container.query selector all. All right. Let's see what's going on here. So, oh, well, this seems like a bug. We're actually trying to call this function passing in container before we actually define container. So let's fix that up. Down here, we'll say elements equals 
run it one more time. Can't find variable markup. All right, what's going on here? Markup equals markup. Ah, comma bug. Great, so the first test passed. Yay, all without leaving our console. Okay, so now that we implemented this guy, let's move on to the more interesting part, actually formatting a, a, a timestamp string uh, into a readable, uh, friendly string. So let's start with millisecond values uh, conver being converted into seconds. So I'm gonna describe a new test. I'm gonna say should convert milliseconds to seconds and return friendly string. Um, okay, so let's see, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we'll need to come up with some, uh, some millisecond value. So it's, it's some delta in milliseconds between two times. Um, so for testing purposes, we know that there are a thousand milliseconds in a second. So if I say a thousand times seven, then that should be seven seconds, right? Okay, so and now I'm going to say, um, oop, I, left, I lost my, uh, left this off, it's no good. Our value, there we go. Um, let's see, now we need let's, to define another variable. Uh, we'll say result string, and down here I'll say result string equals messages dot convert, um, and we'll pass in the value. And then I'll write what my expectation is. What do I expect this to be? Well, it's seven seconds, and I want to get the friendly string back. So I'm going to expect results string to be seven seconds. And I actually want to tell me that this was in the past. So I I'm also want that string to say seven seconds ago, basically what I want to get back. Okay, so let's run this test and see what happens. So I'll just clear the console here. So the first test is still passing, that's good. Uh, the second one is not passing. Um, oh right, so I didn't actually implement convert yet. Okay, I think I would have learned my lesson the first time. Uh, let's go back to our implementation and we'll define a new function, convert. And I'm going to take in a value in milliseconds. Okay, so let's think about how we're going to do this. We want, it to, we want the unit used to be the one that matches most closely. So for example, if I have 7,000 milliseconds, I would expect to see seven seconds. On the other hand, if I had 60,000 milliseconds, I don't want to see 60 seconds, I want to see one minute, because that's the most appropriate unit for that, uh, for that amount of time. So I'm going to define uh, some units here. And first I'll say, first unit will be milliseconds will be a thousand, and the label is second. And then the second one I'll say is a thousand times 60, because that's 60 seconds, and that will give me minutes, and so on and so forth. So for hours, 60 minutes in an hour, and then I'm going to have hours, and then there are 24 hours in one day, so the label here will be day. Okay, great, cool. So now, Let's think about what we need to do next. Well, we'll define a, um, a, a, a result variable. Well, to be clean, let's just go ahead and use one bar statement up here. So I'll say, uh, let's see, result. Okay, so now what I'm going to, going to do is I'm going to loop through all of the possible units and decide which one's most appropriate to use. So I'll say four 
i equals 0. i is less than the length. Um, oops. When length equals units.length, and i is less than length, and then increment i. OK. And then in here, I want to say, I want to do a, do a, do a, um, uh, do a conditional check. So I'll say if uh, milliseconds that was passed in is less than units i, not milliseconds, um, then set the result to milliseconds divided by the units i dot milliseconds. This is getting a little bit messier than I'd like, so let's go ahead and do this. Let's refactor this a little bit to say unit equals units i. OK. Great. Oops. So now we have this implementation. Let's go back and just run our test, see what happens. OK. Uh, did not pass, and we got an error, global leaks detected. Oh, OK. That makes sense, because I actually didn't declare i or length um, or, or unit. So let's fix that. So I'll just declare them up here. And then let's rerun it. OK, now we're getting a different error. Expected undefined to equal seven seconds ago. Let's go back to our test case. And we're saying, OK, the return value of messages.convert is the result string. And we're expecting that to be seven seconds ago. Oh, OK, right. Well, we're not actually returning anything from this function. So that's, that's the problem here. So let's figure out, OK, what do we want to return? So we'll say return. Result, and that's going to give us a number, but we also want the label. So let's define another variable or declare another variable up here to hold the label. And then we'll declare a suffix, say, a go, because we're going to need that later on. So now, in here, once we decide what unit we're using, um, we will go ahead and also assign label equals unit dot label. And then in the bottom, where we return, we're going to return, we're going to build up a string, um, a, a, a return string. So result equals return result plus, we're going to add a space in there. And then we're going to say label. And then we're going to have another space. And we're going to use it at the suffix. Cool. Let's go ahead and test this. Hmm. OK. This doesn't look very good. Expect it 0.00008108 blah, blah, blah to equal seven seconds ago. All right. So clearly, we have some sort of logic bug in our, in our code. Let's go ahead and step through this. So every time it goes through the units, each unit is going to say, if the milliseconds is less than the unit millisecond size, then assign it. Oh, OK. Well, it got to the end of um, you know, the, the last unit, which is days, which is some huge number of milliseconds. And yes, of course, milliseconds is less than that. So it's using the days unit. That's no good. Let's change this around. Let's say if it's more than or equal to, that should give us a better result. OK, we're getting closer. So now it says expect it seven seconds ago to equal seven seconds ago. OK, well, we, we need to pluralize that word. So let's just go ahead and say if um, result is more than one, then label add an S onto the end of the label. Let's go ahead and run that. And hooray, it works. So let's go ahead and basically um, we c we'll just copy this guy. And now we're going to test the other units of time. So we're going to do minutes, we're going to do hours, and we're going to do days. So, yeah. So the 
I think they're, they're going to turn the mic on. Okay. So uh, there was a message saying the global leaks detected. Uh, which part of the framework was responsible for producing that error message? So um, that was actually Mocha's responsibility. So since we're using Mocha, um, it, will, it will check to see if you're using an undeclared global variable. Um, and you can actually, if, you're, if your runtime environment supports it, you can use strict mode, which will throw an error if you do that. Okay. Um, and that's pretty useful because oftentimes you can overwrite global, global variables without realizing it if you just forget to stick on the var statement. So is it like parsing the JavaScript to detect that? Right, so when I, when I run this, a browser is actually running JavaScript, right? Uh, so the okay. JavaScript is being run, it's right. being executed. Yeah, it's definitely being run, but I mean, there should be a, like a first pass of sort of um, uh, parsing through it and uh, detecting these kind of errors. Yeah, different frameworks handle it differently, but what it really comes down to is you want to be running your code in the environment that you're going to ultimately run it in and see if there's any errors, right? And okay. luckily, um, you know, it runs pretty fast, so it's not a big deal to just say, let's go run it and then see what happens. Um, because each unit we're testing is so small, so it runs quite fast. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just finish up these tests real quick. So I'm going to say this one is for minutes. I'm going to say convert milliseconds to minutes. And I'm going to say, okay, I want to have, a, this is going to give me um, one minute, 1,000 times 60 milliseconds. And then I'm going to say, let's go for 9.5. And now I'm going to expect this to be 9.5 minutes ago. And then here for hours, so I'll say 60 times 60 is one hour times one. So this is going to be one hour ago. That's what I expect. And finally, we have days. So this will be a big number. 60 times 60 times 24 times, let's say, 238. We want to say 200, a long time ago. It's a really old message. Um, so here, we expected to say 238 days ago. All right, great. So now let's go back and run all these tests, and we'll see what happens. OK, it looks like they all passed except one, uh, the one that's supposed to convert the value to minutes. So it's saying expect it 9.5 minutes ago to equal 9.5 minutes ago. Hmm. It looks like we have an extra S in there. So let's go ahead and check out what happened. So we go back to our, our units and we look at our labels. Oh, I see. So under minutes, we, we put the S on there, which we, sh we should leave that singular. Let's go rerun our test. And then they all pass. Hooray. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. So let's get out of this funky color scheme. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Go back to the slides. So that about wraps it up. Um, you know, I, hopefully you saw through that example that you know, JavaScript code, when it's written properly, it can be tested. Um, and it's, it's worth doing so. Um, we, we are using it, JavaScript testing internally on different teams. We're trying to push towards using it much more broadly. Um, like I mentioned early in the talk, you know, using it during development is very helpful. Like in this case, we could test very quickly, iterate on our code and see what was working and what was not working, catching some edge cases. Um, but it's also very useful during continuous integration. So we're also uh, we're working on a solution that will allow us to easily run these tests um, by leveraging Selenium Grid and the existing testing infrastructure that we have at the company. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions? Yes. So the classic unit test example involves a function which gets an input and gives back an output. Right. Has no downstream dependencies, isn't calling something else, manipulating some other piece. Almost none of our code is like that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you handle that in JavaScript? Uh, let's say you're changing DOM elements. 
or you have a function that's talking to another function, uh, something you don't have to run th through an example, but just yeah, sort of describe yeah. a, a more complicated scenario. Maybe, you know, we usually aren't changing seconds to minutes. Right. Yep. That's a that's a fair point. So. What I was trying to do with this example is just give you guys a taste. I would, if, if there's interest, I would love to come back later and do a more in-depth, um, I guess, yeah, workshop on strategies. But to answer your question, there's a couple of different strategies you can take. So for the Ajax example, right? Like say you have a control that's sending some content to a server or trying to receive some content from a server. How do you test that in isolation, right? Um, so there's, there's strategies for this. So for example, signon.js, which is a helper library that we use, allows you to mock the XHR browser object. Um, and so what that does is it replaces the, the native uh, uh, XHR object with a, a fake, a fake object. Um, but it will record the requests that come into it uh, that's supposed to be actually sending to a server. And it allows you to simulate sending responses back, you know, just HTTP responses. So in that way, you can simulate the server responding to your, to your call. Um, and uh, there's also other strategies for, you mentioned dependencies. So in the same idea, you would have a mock um, object that would you know, return some known value or you know, return something that works for your code, but you're not actually exercising the other, the other object or the other module. Does that make sense? Yes, so in, uh, the question was, what if you're interacting with the DOM or making extensive use of the DOM? Um, yes, you can mock that, uh, and you, you oftentimes you have to. Um, so in my example here, I was just creating DOM elements through script, which works for a trivial example like this, but if you had a complicated markup, um, what you'd probably wanna do is load, you know, a test, uh, set a test HTML or test fixture to create a test environment, a test DOM environment that you know has the HTML elements you care about, um, you can run your script which interacts with that DOM, and then you can check to see if it's in the correct state that you expect it to be in. So. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I was just wondering um, if you can sort of expand a little more about uh, the direction that um, you're trying to take, uh, or the web development team is trying to take JS unit testing in and um, like in the future, is it going to be something that the QAs run or is it like going to be that like the developers write their own tests and like maintain it and like run it or like what direction is it going, going to look yeah. like? Yeah, thanks Thanks for the question. Um, so what is, what is the future of unit testing here? Well, hopefully, uh, if we have anything to do with it, um, developers will be writing their tests, right? Like we saw in this, even the simple example, if you write your code without tests in mind, it's very hard, right? And in most cases, impossible to actually go back and add tests. So we don't, we don't want a culture or environment where developers write code, hand it over the wall to QA and expect the QA to somehow magically write unit tests for their code. Um, it has to be done during development. So that's what we're going to be promoting. Um, and it's through talks like this and hopefully uh, future workshops will help people understand all of the strategies they'll need to write their code in such a way that it can be tested, uh, as well as some of the frameworks and libraries that are being developed here, like our fork of Dust, um, our Lou JavaScript control framework, those are being uh, tested as they're being developed. So we have a full suite of tests for each of those projects. Hey, so I noticed with your examples that a lot of the stuff was like public members of objects. Is there any way to get at and test private members? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a couple things there. Uh, if you can't access a function outside of, uh, outside of your code, then your test can't, right? Um, so what, there's a couple strategies you can, you can take with that. Uh, one approach is to say, okay, well, I can't actually call those functions, but I can call code that I know calls those functions and then validate that the final output is what I would expect it to be. And then you would end up exercising those functions. So one of the things that we didn't talk about here um, is code coverage, right? Um, it's something that we are, are actively working on is to add a capability to a tool that we're building to make sure that we can generate code coverage reports so we'll have some idea of how well our code is being tested. 
Any other questions? No? OK, one, one final note. Uh, you can go to go slash JS test. That is the, the web page that um, my group keeps um, up to date with the latest and what we're doing. And if you have any questions, feel free to send an email to jstest at linkedin.com. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>